to congratulate Mitch and the Cape Horse Center for Social Impact on being recognized as one of the top 20 Oakland influencers and that recognized by the city of Oakland. And this is what the city of Oakland says, more than any other entity, Cape Or Capital and the Cape Or Center have championed the equitable growth of Oakland's tech economy. And they've truly led in focusing and investing on the core issues of growth, which is increasing diversity in tech in Oakland. So, so you've been investing a lot in Oakland. How many startups have you invested here? I think we have now at least half a dozen Oakland-based uh, startups, uh, most of which uh, we've done in the past year. And I expect to see a lot more. Just in Oakland. Okay, but you've been here for four, you've lived here for four years, but you haven't necessarily been just investing in Oakland-based startups. Right. Well, we decided after 10 years south of market, uh, f five years ago, that Oakland was going to be the next big tech hub. And as usual, my colleagues mostly thought I'd grown a second head, but... Um, that was 10 years ago. Was, Oakland wasn't as yeah. hit back then. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't on the map, but we could tell that South Market was getting full. Innovation wasn't stopping. Oakland had all of the raw material of lots of great underutilized space and a, a kind of a, a, a resilience and an interest in welcoming tech. And so we bet heavily five years ago on, on moving to Oakland, uh, both our office uh, and uh, our residence. Right. And one of the reasons, I remember when we spoke a couple of years ago, one of the reasons you liked Oakland too is because you thought that because of Oakland's diversity, it would actually change the way um, companies would be formed because of the, the diverse backgrounds would have different perspectives on what kind of startups to create. Well, that's right. I mean, Oakland has a unique uh, history, uh, very uh, progressive roots that exist to this day. Look, I was in Starbucks yesterday in um, next to our office, which is in uptown Oakland, at, like Grand and, and Broadway, and there in Starbucks is a woman named Elaine Brown. Now, I imagine most of you may not know who she is. She was one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, and she was the most sane and leader that they have and has had like a long 40-year career uh, as, uh, as an activist. And there she is just over at the next table. And if I could have thought of what to say to her, I would have, uh, I would have introduced myself. And I was, I was talking to Frida about it, and... She said, you could have said, well, thank you for your service. And I said, well, maybe next time. But the point is, Oakland has a tradition and resources uh, and a diverse population. The material circumstances are quite different than in San Francisco, and it's a much better base on which to build a tech ecosystem in which tech is done right, in which the tech companies what they, the value they produce benefits not just their shareholders, but the whole community, and that's, that's our intention, to foster that. Yeah. I, before we go on, I do want to mention that Mitch wanted to make this really interactive, so in about 10 minutes, we are going to put up Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, and you put in hashtag Vader Splash, and you can ask questions to Mitch. We'll actually take a look at the slides, and we'll, Mitch can select his questions, whatever questions he'd like. So, um, so get your questions um, ready. So this year, you've implemented what's called the Founders Commitment, and that's to encourage your portfolio companies to think more diversely or to have more diverse goals and try to reach them. What kind of goals have they set out for themselves? So the Founders Commitment was something Cape War Capital did earlier this year, intended originally to be forward-looking, something we wanted new companies we were investing in to sign on to. We gave our existing portfolio the opportunity to opt in, and 76 of the companies did, about three-quarters three of them, which was really amazing and gratifying. I mean, what we're 
asking in the founders' commitment is um, there's a simple acronym, GIVE. The G stands for goals. We ask companies to set goals for uh, hiring uh, a diverse workforce that makes sense given their stage and their sector and, 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 and where they are. Um, we ask them to take advantage of the kinds of resources that now exist uh, in terms of people ops technology, uh, platforms and services that can help them build inclusive cultures and mitigate uh, bias at scale. Um, and we ask that they engage with their employees in volunteer activities in the community uh, and that they educate themselves about uh, diversity and inclusion broadly. And we run workshops uh, in our uh, uh, Capo Capital is for its companies and assist them with this. So basically, there's no magic bullet around getting a diverse workforce, but if you try to bake it in from the outset, at the beginning, and have diversity and inclusion part of your corporate DNA, you have a much better chance of succeeding with it over the long term than if you just put it off. I mean, we see the Googles and Facebooks and others struggling to make good on their commitments to diversify their workforces, and it's difficult for them. So we believe in baking it in from the outset, and that's what the founder's commitment is about. What, how do you, I know you said there's no magic bullet, but how do you measure how, uh, how, how diverse a, a startup is, or becoming? Well, actually, I mean, keeping track of aggregate statistics of, um, you know, who's on the team, and particularly around how many uh, folks from groups that have been underrepresented, which in tech, that means women of all backgrounds, and then African Americans and Latinos, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, but it also can mean things like, committing to the Rooney Rule. Let me explain the Rooney Rule very quickly. Named after an owner of a pro football team. And it basically says when you hire, the candidate pool must include people from a diversity of backgrounds before you actually offer the job. So you offer the job to whoever you ultimately select but the requirement, if you live by the Rooney Rule, is that in assembling the candidate pool, that that's diverse. And we can help people do that. There are ways to go beyond the usual outreach. And that's a tactic that can help and, and can be measured. Well, Frida measured it for us last year. When she was here, she said, inside tech companies, on average, 60% of the teams are white, 28 to 30 are Asian, and 3% are black. And quoting Frida, she says, this isn't what America looks like. So is this the number, of, what is the number or ratio you're trying to get to? We are not trying to get to a particular number, nor do we think particular numbers should be prescribed by anyone. That sets up, uh, sets things up for actually for disaster. As, as I said that when we work with an individual company around their diversity goals, it needs to take into account their particular circumstances. Example, if you are an ed tech company and you're making a product that is largely going to be used in public school classrooms in, in the U.S., noting that the majority of kids in public K-12 are already students of color, already. You would want to have a team that significantly reflects the composition of the population that you're serving. I mean, that just makes business sense because the lived experience of those folks is going to be highly relevant to successfully delivering your product or service. So a company in EdTech might set its hiring goals around that, whereas another company um, 
you know, might set it quite differently. We have a, a lot of great questions here, but, you know, there's a lot of startups ah. here, I think, who are backed by, or who would like to be backed by many venture capitalists here in Silicon Valley, many of whom are white males. And this is actually a great question from Ronnie Kerr, who's one of the Vader News reporters, and he says that most VT teams uh, are composed of these older white men who aren't thinking about diversity, so how can startups be expected to pursue diversity when their backers don't believe in it or don't encourage it or, or it's not really something that they, they focus on? So we've been very outspoken on this subject. There's a piece in Medium that Frida and I wrote titled, I think, uh, like, Dear Investors, So You Want to Take Diversity Seriously, addressed to our colleagues in venture that says, hear a lot about how there's more interest among venture capitalists in building a diverse portfolio, seriously, what you need to do is to start by increasing the diversity within your own teams, within your own investors. And there are lots of interesting conversations going on now where people, my colleagues, are confronting the gap between their desire to make venture more diverse and what they see as the practical difficulties of it. And um, I'm not that optimistic, but I am slightly optimistic. We're beginning to see change uh, in, in venture and we have to keep pounding on it. And in the meantime, it is a fact that if you come from a non-traditional or underrepresented background as an entrepreneur, it is likely, if not inevitable, if you're out trying to raise money, that you're going to have to work harder and be better than other startups that come from, you know, where their resumes sort of more match the pattern of what people want. It is unfair. And it is the way things are. Well, this is, you know, VCs are looking for, this is a good question, I'm going to go to it. So VCs are looking for strategic business advantages. This question got nine thumbs up, so I guess everyone, people like it. So do you focus on diversity because it's the right moral thing to do, or are there strategic business advantages? So there are strategic business advantages. Let me, a long list. Let me mention just one, sake of time, which is that certain segments are unbelievably overcrowded. This is they're overcompeted um, in you know I don't know photo sharing sites and consumer applications for uh, you know relatively affluent millennials. Whereas there are all sorts of opportunities to bring products and services to underserved markets, to low and middle income communities, that there isn't a lot of competition. And in fact, an entrepreneur who comes from, whose lived experience is different, who has seen a different set of problems, is going to see a different set of opportunities for solving those problems. And there will be uh, great opportunities to invest in them. Uh, so Pigeonly, for instance, Fre Frederick Hudson, they offer low-cost phone calls for people who are incarcerated and other services that keep families together. Uh, and it is, a, you know, went through uh, Y Combinator, successfully raised money as a growing kind of business. It's not the sort of thing you're likely to think up in your four years at Stanford. And so... Um, uh, lots of strategic business advantages. It also happens to be the right moral thing to do. Uh, we believe so both. But even if you're agnostic about the morality of it, um, building a team or investing in teams where their lived experience uh, reflects the community uh, being served is nothing but common sense. 
Now, your mission besides diversity is, because di diversity and your mission of, of investing in startups that can have a social impact, they, uh, they're not one and the same. There are they? Okay. So you've invested in Uber, which has social impact. They have created hundreds and thousands of jobs. Is that a company? Did that fall in, under your social impact uh, oh. umbrella? Uber, we invested in Uber in 2009, so, um, which was before we had formalized the social impact approach. Uh, discussing Uber's social impact, you could spend an entire day on that. There are obviously huge positives, and there have been a bunch of negatives on that. What I would say, and, and we've co continued to try within the sphere of small influence that we have of pushing Uber in uh, the, the positive direction, it's been an enormous learning experience for us. And so the on-demand marketplace investments we have made post-Uber reflect those learnings. So we're investors in Honor, which does uh, home health care, and we just invested in Managed by Q, which provides office cleaning and other services. Both of those companies, when they employ the people who provide the services, they're employees, they're not contractors, they get benefits, there is a, a, la a career ladder so people can take on increasing amounts of responsibility. And both of those companies... Um, in addition to being great businesses, uh, are creating lots and lots of well-paying, uh, uh, good-paying jobs that uh, are uh, on the ladder uh, uh, to, the, to the middle class. And so Uber is still wrestling with contractors and you know, unionization. And I mean, as I said, we could spend a whole day on it. Our takeaway is to look for companies in the on-demand marketplace that are going to create large numbers of good jobs for people and that we see multiple such opportunities. Right. Well, driving is not a bad job. Oh, it's a great second job. It's not a great primary source of income. It's a great second job, whether it's Uber or Lyft or others, because of the flexibility. So if you're a student or a parent, or you have other things that you do, and you want to be able to work when you want to work, mm -hmm. set your own hours. I mean, you just, you know, I've talked to dozens of, of drivers. They love that because nothing else affords that possibility. Um, that said, as a, as a primary job, given the price competition that is out there, the take for the drivers, continues to be squeezed, and it's a struggle. Hmm. Kind of contemplating whether I should ask this question. What do you think, Mitch? Kind well, of moves us into a different direction. What's yeah. that? Ask anything you want. No, that's the, the, the top one. Tech moving into Oakland is going to have a whole series of unintended consequences. Housing prices being an example. Sure. How can tech be part of the solution? Well, so, first of all, I'm not a Pollyanna. I don't, I think there will, under the best of circumstances, be disruptive effects when you get a lot of tech moving into, uh, into a community uh, with uh, displacement uh, of residents. That said, I think we can learn lessons from across the Bay. I mean, the first thing is that the tech community should literally engage with and get to know <laughs> the community and the people who are in it and not be a kind of, you know, a bubble uh, unto itself. Sort so, of like what Pandora does, which is let everybody out for well, lunch. Pandora, yes, Pandora does, has never had its own internal food service, uh, even though they have like, a thousand employees, because they want people out and around and, you know, uh, eating lunch and supporting local merchants and, 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 and being around. But there are a lot of things like, like just engagement to understand what the conditions are. Um, and then there are things that companies can do in terms of 
hiring, in terms of uh, sourcing uh, supply chain uh, locally. Um, I thought it would be, and this is an idea I keep pushing uh, with Uber, who's bringing in, you know, thousands of employees when their, their building is open. They should provide a benefit uh, for drivers and their families uh, uh, in, in one of the coding schools or, you know, b b boot camps to, uh, of which there are a number in Oakland, particular, some that particularly are focused on underrepresented people of color, to enable those folks to get uh, a foot into uh, a, a career uh, in, in tech. So, oh, this is an interesting question. What criteria do you use to evaluate companies you invest in? And, and let me answer that for you, but then you can explain. I, I think this is a good way for companies. I talk to a lot of startups, and they want to get involved in having a, you know, having, um, a socially conscious you know, or a, a um, agenda or goal, and but they don't know how to sort of what questions to ask about whether they have a social mission or not. And you have something on your website called gap closing endeavors, and that's probably a good way to for a startup. That's that's a criteria that you apply. You ask them if they have a gap closing endeavor, and that's some. Those are questions they probably should ask themselves. Am I closing the gap? Is that is that a yeah, absolutely. I mean, we ask, who's going to benefit? In other words, who is the product or service intended for? Whose life is it going to make better? And in what way? And then we ask, is it going to close some sort of a gap of access or opportunity or outcome for some underserved group? And so, Sector by sector, the analysis proceeds differently at the detailed level because ed tech is not the same as fintech and that's not the same as health. But the fact that a service, let's say, is in, you know, it, 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 it's some sort of health or health IT doesn't for us mean it has positive social impact. So for instance, or better yet, in ed tech. So there's alt school. Alt school has raised a ton of money, very high profile, um, and it's still a work in progress, so I'm not issuing any kind of final judgment. But the focus there is on, fam is on families that can afford to pay $20,000 a year in tuition for some complete reinvention of the school experience. This is not gap closing, period. I don't, it doesn't matter what the scholarship part of it is, it's clearly directed at affluent parents. So it may produce value for them. It may, in the long term, have broader consequences. I hope it does. But we, we passed on it on a couple of occasions because it is, in our view, gap widening, not gap closing, because it enables affluent parents to purchase further advantage for their kids. So for I don't mean to pick on old school. Um, because it's that analysis is something that we do a lot, and there are a number of high-profile things that, by their standards, are have positive social impact, but not by ours. So there's a, a lot of startups, I'm sure, deep down, want to have a social impact, whether it's taking some revenue and, and, and donating it, but they also want to have an economic impact. So you've been investing a while with this thesis. What is the... What is the big? Can you highlight a, one of the, your your stars and and you know for many here, many venture capitalists who are, who are looking more for sort of an economic return. Um, what, what is that company doing? And we it are, like? let's be clear, looking for economic return. We don't. We're not in the business of sacrificing economic return for social impact. In fact, I think that's a misframing. Save oh, that, I didn't say save that, that you... for another time. But what we are interested in are companies where their value creation engine simultaneously produces economic and social value. So take LendUp, for instance, which is uh, an alternative to payday lending and the kind of horrible debt traps that people get into, which provides uh, loans but give you a way as you repay them to have uh, decreasing rates of interest 
and helps you rebuild a credit score so you can move into the mainstream. LendUp is doing extremely well. They've had several rounds of financing. They're getting quite large, and it's, a, it's definitely a gap-closing kind of fintech company. And that's one of your That's one of big ours. Stars. We, were in, we were in the, the seed stage of LendUp. There's some ed tech companies, uh, Nuzella and uh, uh, No Red Ink and Front Row Education, that have millions of users and millions in revenue that are, are, are classroom products aimed at K-12 public schools in the U.S. that uh, are helping close the, the, the achievement gap. Um, they've all gone on to Series A and, in some case, Series B rounds and are, are doing well. So we were in the seed there. So I have one last question, yeah. because I, we have the red, the red zone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that means we have the time's up. But you have $25 million you've earmarked for, to invest in diverse, diverse companies, correct? Or companies that can extend sort of this, uh, your diversity thesis and, and goals. So what are you looking for um, with that $25 million? What kind of companies? Well, the, the $25 million is three years of uh, Cape or Capital investing. So we are looking for seed stage startups that close gaps, uh, that have the possibility of achieving venture scale. So EdTech, FinTech, health, uh, on-demand economy. All the portfolio is up on the website as well as the investment criteria. Uh, we put a bunch of work uh, into trying to get the wording right for people to see and invite folks if they're, you know, they think it's a fit to come and, and contact us. Okay. Well, if you have one of those companies that fit that criteria, I'm sure Mitch would like to speak with you. No, I'm sure. <laughs> Please don't, don't, don't mob me. We, it's not me. I'm the front guy, but the investment team is eight folks now. My partner, well, Brian Dixon, and then Frida and, and Ben Jealous and some other very talented folks. So... We use a group effort to look at everything. Well, they'll be here this afternoon. Speaking yes, uh, Anthony in the investor Heckman room. and Carolina Huronka, yeah. who are our associate and principal, are on the program later. Okay. So. All right. Well, with that, right. thank you, Mitch. You're welcome. Thank you.